Home ownership has become increasingly out of reach for most Americans. For too many people, the dream of having a good home it still feels out of reach. I get it. This week on What's America Thinking, we're diving into the housing crisis, a huge concern for both Republican and Democratic lawmakers, and why the majority of people say the American dream of owning a home is dead. A recent Harris poll shows that while 81% of renters say they would like to own a home, 61% say they're worried they'll never be able to afford it. That poll also shows the biggest obstacles to the dream of home ownership are record high interest rates and not having enough cash. According to the Federal Reserve economic data, just 40 years ago, the average price of a home was more than $78,000, which is adjusted for inflation. That's about three and a half times what the average income was. But two years ago, the average price of a home had more than quintupled, $433,000, nearly six times the average income. The housing crisis has been affecting Americans across the country. Here's what some of you had to say. You know, the idea of like a starter home, I think is basically gone. It's uh, increasingly out of reach. <laughs> Even in Tulsa, uh, the, the rate that housing prices have increased has been pretty phenomenal, especially if there's unsustainable high interest rates too. I think in, in, in the States as well, uh, I can see that the mortgages and the interest rates are getting higher and higher every day. Um, a house that could have been purchased pre, you know, 2016, you know, is where I live at is going for two or three hundred thousand dollars more than what it did then. I do fear um, the younger generation, especially college students coming right out of college, um, you know, being sold a lot of times this dream of um, you know, anything's achievable, a lot of them are going to have a really hard time, you know, getting to that place their parents were able to get to much, much easier. If you're in some smaller southern, more rural areas, it seems affordable, but when you're in places like D.C. and New York and California, it can be extremely high. So, what's behind the unaffordable prices and sky-high inflation? Here to answer all of these questions is News Nation's business contributor, Gary B. Smith. Gary, thanks so much for being here. Just to kick this off, what's the number one issue causing homes to skyrocket right now? Well, you know, Julia, you hear a lot of reasons, but as usual, it's, you know, this is all economics and it's, it's just supply out there. A lot of people say the supply might be exacerbated by people, I suppose, like me, not wanting to move uh, and you know have to get a higher mortgage rate. But uh, yeah, there's there really is a lack of supply out there. We've been hearing a lot of about of a potential repeat of the 2008 housing market crash. Do you think this could happen again? Uh, in our lifetimes, yeah, sure. I, I imagine. But I don't think anytime soon, you know, you have to remember the 2008 housing crisis was fueled by easy credit and by a lot of speculation, especially in hot areas like Las Vegas, Phoenix, places like that. I just don't see that now. And remember, even the, this, the, the crash, if you will, in 2008, the prices only dropped about 10 percent, the median price. So it wasn't like 40, 50 percent. But are we going to get that kind of uh, pullback? I not in, not in the near term, I don't think. Right, right. So the National Association of Realtors just settled a case that, um, you know, alleged the industry worked to keep commissions artificially high. How much will this benefit home buyers? You know, uh, we're in the kind of the process of looking to sell our place and move. So I'm maybe a little bit closer than most people. I, and I've read a lot of articles saying, oh my gosh, you know, the prices are going to dramatically come down. I'm, I'm not so sure. Remember, the, you know, real estate agents still have a monopoly out there. There's very few people that, you know, sell by owner, if you will. And if I want to sell my place, you know, that I pay my, uh, the broker 6% as a seller, and then he or she splits it with the, uh, the buyer's agent, you know, that the agent in, in my place is going to still have to take a lot of pictures, have to market it, uh, maybe do open houses. It might be on the, it might be on, you know, his or her books for who knows, depending on the price, three, six, nine months. That's a lot of effort. And I think a lot of people are going to, you know, the, the 6% is, is worthwhile. Others though might say, geez, you know, everyone's finding it on Zillow. All I have to do is be here, have my agent here, 
you know, once a month or so, and I should be fine. So I, I think it's not going to have dramatic effect as most people think. You know, there's so many theories about why prices are so high when it comes to houses and homes, but the Congressional Joint Economic Committee says the high prices are at least partially due to a housing shortage. Do you think we're facing an availability pr crisis? Yeah, you know, it's funny. You read that document, which honestly is kind of a political document. I think the background is they want to get more government involvement in housing. And then you look at the National Association of Realtors puts out a, a document that says looks, you know, by metropolitan area all across the country. And they conclude with, you know, very few exceptions, supply is is fine out there. There is no uh, housing shortage. I guess it, I, I, you know, I just look in my area here in Jacksonville and across the board, I still see a lot of homes available and available for sale. And, you know, at quite reasonable prices. Maybe it depends on the area. If you're looking for, you know, $50 million condominiums in uh, Manhattan, yeah, maybe that supply is a little limited. <laughs> So on that note, actually, you know, obviously New York City is at one end of the spectrum. I'm coming from Washington, D.C. You're in Jacksonville. But how much do costs differ between cities and rural areas? And when I say cities, I don't necessarily mean just D.C. and uh, New York City, right. but also cities like Jacksonville, for example. Right. It, you know, it depends on the area. You know, Jacksonville is a great example because the the urban core, as they call it, of Jacksonville is actually very small, but the city is, well, it's the biggest city, you know, square mileage in the country. It's 950 square miles. So you can be in the city, but still kind of, you know, in, in versus other cities kind of be rural, if you will, and still within the city confines. So one, it depends on the city. Two, even, you know, generically, the prices don't differ as much as I thought they would, maybe about 10 percent, you know, even coming after the whole COVID where people exited these cities, the growth rate in prices for urban areas is still higher and the prices are a little bit higher. But generally, yeah, if you want a, a lower price and you're willing to be outside of a city, rural or let's just call it suburban, you're probably going to get a little bit better value. So I've spoken with a lot of friends who are millennials or Generation Z, and they've essentially expressed this concern of, I think I'll be renting forever. Um, you know, this is just something I'm going to have to accept. And there's also anecdotal, um, you know, p pieces of information that suggest a lot of millennials and people in Gen Z and maybe other generations are getting help to buy these homes from their family or, you know, some sort of a connection. How much are millennials and Gen Z individuals in particular having to rely on their families to, for help when purchasing a home? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, statistics are always interesting. I read where 38 percent of Gen Z get financial assistance from their parents, which sounds kind of hot. Yeah. But then you got to remember Gen Z, the home ownership is only about of the percentage of Gen Z population is only about three percent. So it's a very still small amount of homes out there. I I don't think that's a bad thing, by the way, uh, relying on your parents for assistance. But I'm not so sure that, you know, when they say, oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to rent for my entire life. You know, maybe we'll talk about this in a minute or so. I'm not so sure that's a terrible idea. Really, really? Could we dive in on that? Just you know, why renting isn't necessarily a terrible idea? Because I don't know. I, I've learned you know, home buying is is a good goal. But it, you know, talk about renting. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm not so sure. You know, I look back. So I've owned a home uh, in one or a condo, like I do now, for uh, let's see, almost uh, almost forty five years. And I look back and if I had taken the down payment that my wife and I put in our first home and instead just put it into the market and just left it there and instead paid, you know, the average apartment rate for a two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom as the kids got older, we'd still be a couple million dollars ahead. And here's the reason why, you know, people think, all right, I buy a home, you know, I build up all this equity. So we've had seven homes. We've lost money on four, made money on three. Then you add in 
property tax, higher property taxes, uh, homeowners insurance, maintenance, uh, 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 HOA fees, it, uh, lawn care. Home ownership is very, very expensive. I, I love living in all the homes that we have. It was great to raise our kids there, but if I had to do it over again, I and some would say, oh my gosh, you can great, get this great apartment, of which there are a lot more than there were when I first owned a home. I don't think it's such a bad trade-off. Right, right. And I just want to stay on this for a minute just because it's so fascinating to me and it's, you know, big in my, my uh, respective generation. But, you know, what do you say to the argument that if you're renting, particularly in a bigger city, you're just throwing thousands of dollars away each month? I mean, what's the counterpoint to that then? No, the counterpoint is that you don't have to pay you know, I guess the standard is you'd pay 20% down, if you will. I guess maybe mortgages vary now, but you know, say you, you wanted to buy a $500,000 place, and you put down, you know, 100,000. That's 100,000. Then you bought an apartment. Yes, you're you're paying that whatever. Maybe a nice two bedroom around where I live is call it $2,200. Mm -hmm. So you pay the 2,200, which of course is gone every month, but you have the $100,000 in the bank or in a, in a mutual fund or something like that. You don't have to pay, um, you know, you have to pay, you know, uh, renter's insurance, but you don't have to pay to, you know, fix a house or, or repair a house if it gets blown away in a hurricane. You don't have to fix the lawn. You don't have to take care of the pool if you have one. So I'd say if you're just looking at a cost benefit analysis, like I say, you're, you might actually be better off renting. Right, right. So, and you mentioned two things there: the possibility of, you know, a hurricane or some sort of nat natural disaster, and insurance. You know, Fed Chair Jerome Powell said climate change is behind the reason why a lot of insurance companies refuse to insure homes in high-risk areas, which leave buyers without homeowners insurance um, unable to close. Ultimately, will we see more of this in the future, particularly in those high-risk areas? Well, first of all, I have to, just as a sidebar, I have to laugh. Now, everything is the fault of climate change. In actuality, uh, you know, companies like here in Florida, State Farm pulled out because they're losing money. It, it does, regardless of what caused, you know, the hurricanes, they, they're they losing money. When, when companies pull out then and they can't, they're not going to make any money, then homeowners insurance goes away. I'm not so, again, I'm not so sure that's a bad thing. People shouldn't be living in the areas where there's a high frequency of a hurricane destroying your home or a tornado wiping you out or a flood. You know, these people like in California that live along the coast where the coast is eroding and let's like, say Malibu, for example, they shouldn't be living there. <laughs> and if they do want to live there, then they have to get either, you know, private insurance, a self-insure or something like that, move to other parts of the country that are a little bit better. That's just... I think that's just good economic sense, if you will. Yeah, I guess it's a trade-off for that nice view of the Pacific Ocean for um, you know living in a eroded beach area. Look, Gary, we're in the 2024 election cycle right now. How much is this topic political? Can we expect President Biden and former President Trump to campaign on this? Um, you know, I I think they might, and and here's the reason why. Maybe Biden more than Trump. Look, I. Maybe I'm a, 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 a conspiracy theorist, if you will. I always think government likes to get into more businesses. Look, they already, you know, have Fannie Mae. They already have Sally Mae. They're pretty much in the the mortgage brokerage business. Why not try to get into the home ownership business? You know, they're pushing home ownership. I don't think they should be pushing home ownership versus renting a car or buying a car. But they seem to want to get into that as a way, quite honestly, to expand power. Um, I don't think it's on the top of their list of things to campaign about. I think it's more, you know, the war in Ukraine, immigration, of course, taxes. But I wouldn't doubt that it will come up. Absolutely. Well, Gary Smith, thank you for joining us and thank you for some good advice. I know that a lot of millennials and Gen Z individuals that will be listening to this. You bet, Julia. Thank you. Thanks. If you could even afford a house today, what's it going to cost and how long will you be paying for it? Staff writer Rafael Bernal breaks down the numbers across the U.S. The median earner in about 20 American states 
cannot afford the typical house on a 30-year mortgage. Let's break down some real estate numbers. We took median income numbers according to FRED, that's the Federal Reserve Economic Data Tool, and compared those to Zillow's Home Value Index. Now, let's not go under the hood too much. The housing market is dynamic, household income is not fixed, and that's before taking inflation into account. So any numbers here are merely guidelines. Starting with the country, according to FRED and the Census Bureau, the median household earned $74,508 in 2022. We're using 2023 housing numbers. So let's kick up that 2022 income by 5% to account for wages rising. We get $78,309. The typical home price in August of 2023 nationwide was $417,700. So all we need to do now is divide the typical home price by the median yearly earnings and we get 5.33. That's the number of years the median household needs to pay the typical house. Real estate crisis solved? Well, of course, you're only supposed to spend 28% of your income on a mortgage payment. So it'll take 19 years to pay off the mortgage. Uh, wrong again. We forgot the interest rate. Banks aren't going to give away free money. So at 7% interest after a 20% down payment, that's 83,540 out of pocket. It will take 36.6 years to pay off that mortgage. And banks usually only give up to 30 year mortgages. That's nationwide. If you try this math in the country's biggest cities, the numbers are even worse. In Los Angeles, it'll take the median earner 83 years to pay that mortgage on a typical home. In New York, it's just 71 years. Chicago can rejoice. By our numbers, it's just off that 30 year mark at 31 years to pay off the house. All is not lost. In 30 states, the median earner can pay off their mortgage responsibly in 30 years. In Iowa, 15-year mortgages are almost a reality. The magic number there is 17.5 years. But in Hawaii, it's almost like living in New York. It'll take the median earner almost 60 years to pay for that typical house. A major Republican showdown took place in Ohio this week, and all eyes were on Trump's campaign clout. We have to elect Bernie to get in there and to seal our border stop inflation, crush the deep state, drill baby drill, and prevent World War III. The Buckeye State held its GOP primary for Senate to see who will take on Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown in the fall. And Trump-backed Bernie Marino, a former car dealer and blockchain entrepreneur, came out on top against State Senator Matt Dolan, a vocal anti-Trumper. We're going to win this race in November. We're going to retake the United States Senate. We're going to have President Trump in the White House. The race illustrated the battle lines between the former president's MAGA movement and Ohio's GOP establishment. It's time to go on the record with Scott Tranter, director of data science from Decision Desk HQ. Scott, as always, it's great to see you. This was a major test on Trump's influence over what could shape Senate control this fall. What is the main takeaway from the Ohio primary? Well, Trump's endorsement, it certainly helped out Bernie Moreno. Not only did he win, but he outperformed his polling. Um, now, the Democrats did spend in the final week supporting Bernie Moreno because that is their preferred candidate to run against. Um, but, you know, Donald Trump came out, did a rally. Bernie Moreno is on pace to significantly outpace his polling. Um, you know, if you ask both sides, the Republicans say, think they got the candidate they want and the Democrats got the matchup on the Republican side they want. So this will be a real close race for control of the Senate this fall. So on that point about Democrats propping up Bernie Marino, isn't there some risk involved in that? Because I remember in 2022 when Senator J.D. Vance was running, he was backed by Trump. He embraced Trump and it seemed to work out well for him ultimately in the general election. Um, you know, did Democrats prop up the wrong candidate? You know, it, it's entirely possible. It didn't work for them, as you noted, in the last cycle. Um, and you know what? Ohio is a tough state for Democrats to win. I think, you know, everyone thinks of Ohio as a battleground. But interestingly enough, the state Senate, state House, and obviously governor, um, and and half the half the uh, the congressional delegation and Senate is and is controlled by the Republicans. So you know, on paper, it feels like a a, a swing state, but on uh, uh, in reality, it is not. 
Um, the Democrats are just trying to pick a candidate that's going to give them an edge here. And so they thought that was Bernie Moreno. I think when DDHQ releases its ratings later this summer, it's going to be a lean Republican or at least open there, despite Sherrod Brown being a very good candidate and obviously an incumbent senator. Democrats are just trying to play the odds here and give themselves a little bit of a better chance. But we'll see if it works. It did, as you pointed out, it didn't work for J.D. Vance. Yeah, and worth noting that Sherrod Brown is the last statewide elected Democrat in Ohio, so certainly formidable, but a tough road ahead for him. Scott, what are other states we're, that we're seeing battle lines drawn between Trump and other conservatives? Well, one I'd like to point out, and so, so, certainly battle lines, is we had a poll out today, Maryland, um, former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, um, ahead of his potential Democratic um, primary opponents, or, I'm sorry, general election opponents. And it's interesting, um, Larry Hogan, not a not a Trump supporter, so to speak, very vocally not. Um, Donald Trump basically saying, I'm not going to say anything bad against him. It'll be interesting to see whether there is a MAGA candidate that comes out in that GOP primary um, that goes against him, if Trump can keep his mouth quiet and, 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 and see if uh, he can stay out of that. That's certainly one to look at. Um, we, we talked about Montana last time. I'm on Montana. Um, you know, Donald Trump ended up endorsing um, and clearing the field, um, uh, getting Matt Rosendale out. Um, you know, he, he's definitely flexing his muscle and certainly setting himself up to be a player if the Republicans retake the House. I'm sorry, keep the House and retake the Senate. Yeah, it's interesting because we know that, you know, Senate Republicans uh, in the campaign arm, I should say, have been very supportive of um, Larry Hogan, while also supportive of more Trumpian candidates like Kerry Lake in Arizona. Scott, Decision Desk has Trump's lead over President Biden narrowing down to just 7.7 percent. Is there any new data coming uh, in that could turn his lead into a loss? Uh, you know what? This is, we are now getting into the prime, the very early stages of the general election. I think you're going to see this type of tightening lead. We'll probably see Joe Biden maybe go ahead as he starts advertising. Um, but I think we're going to see this back and forth. Notably, this is, we are, we are a little bit more than 10 days after the State of the Union. So there's a lot of polls that can't, had come out post that. And so I think we're seeing some tightening there. Um, this is a little bit nerdy, but for your audience, a lot of these polls are, are looking at general electorate registered voters. Um, we're going to see a lot of polls later this summer where they just look at likely voters. And so that's where I think we might see it flip or certainly tighten even more. Um, this is just the opening innings and we'll see it go back and forth, I think. And so and I know we're, you know, obviously, like you said, in the opening inning and you don't have a crystal ball. But I got to ask, if the election were held today, does decision desk analysis show Trump winning comfortably? So that is a great question. And here's how I like to answer this one. We're going to have a statistical model where I'm going to give you a percentage here in the next couple of months. We've got it. Now that we're out of the primary, we get out of there. I'm going to present it this way. Let's say I have $1,000 to bet. I can bet anywhere from zero to $1,000. And if I bet $1,000, I'm absolutely sure of the outcome. If I bet $0, I have no idea of the outcome. Right now, I would bet on a hundred. I would bet a hundred dollars that Donald Trump wins this fall. If the elect, or I'm sorry, wins this fall based on where we're at. So I'm a little bit sure he's slightly ahead, but I'm nowhere near a thousand dollars going to bet the house on it. Huh. Interesting. So, Scott, the biggest concern for both candidates will be the seven key battleground states, starting with Arizona. What are your latest numbers showing? Um, Arizona just had a primary last night. That was an easy call for both um, uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Um, their counting hasn't gotten any better. We're going to still be waiting for results for another week. Um, Arizona could be the tipping point state, the one that we need to know to call the presidential election this fall, and it's going to take a week there. Um, the polling's got to sort itself out. I mean, that one keeps going back and forth. Fourth, um, you know, I mean, if you show the average up here, I think you'll see Donald Trump has a slight lead. But again, that's under those registered voter polls. Once we get those likely voter ones out, I think we're going to see that lead tighten. So Trump recently said, quote, any Jewish person that votes for Democrats hates their religion and everything about Israel. We know Jewish Americans tend to lean Democratic. But I got to ask, is Trump throwing away an opportunity with this constituency by making those comments? It certainly doesn't help him. And I think the argument for the Trump campaign, and we see it is, it's a great line for him to fundraise. It's also a great line for the Democrats to fundraise, right? Like he's not very articulate about how he's saying it, but basically what he's saying is, I am you know, more supportive of Israel um, than the Democrats are. It's not the greatest way to say it, but to the, to the certain amount of Jewish Americans who might resonate with that, it works for them. It does turn a lot of them off. It does create a lot of news headlines. Um, and there's a lot of Democrats making a lot of campaign noise about it. 
Um, I, you know what? We've seen Trump say this kind of stuff for the last five, six, seven years. It's never the thing that takes him down. It's the thing that polarizes him. Some people will dislike him more because of it. Some people will like him mo even more because of it. It just splits down the middle. And speaking of Trump's remarks, he recently was talking about a potential trade war with China and warned of a, quote, bloodbath if Biden is elected. You know, are Republicans concerned about Trump's rhetoric and tone at this point? <laughs> you know, if this were summer of 2015, or early 2016, I would say yes. But at this point, again, this is stuff he's been saying five, six, seven, eight years and this is the, the stuff he's been saying, and voters on the Republican side and, and party elites on the Republican side have had opportunity to push back on it, and now they just kind of rally around it or they don't necessarily acknowledge it. I think these types of statements, they're the norm for Donald Trump. You know, from his point of view, it's worked for him, and it's, he's going to continue to do this kind of stuff going forward. Shifting gears to President Biden, are we seeing any states, in addition to Michigan and Minnesota, calling for Democrats to vote uncommitted during the primaries? There are a few left. Um, you know what? I should it should know this off the top of my head. I think we're going to see a few out west here in the next month or so, and then we're going to see a few more in the southeast. Um, you know, so that's certainly going to be a little bit of a story. As you know, Joe Biden has officially clinched enough pledge delegates. Now he's going to have to officially go through the process in the convention here in a few months. But he's there. The uncommitted, um, you know, it was a great story a couple of weeks ago. There's probably going to be a couple of more states here. He might even, you know, they might even get into the five, ten, you know, low double digits. Um, but that largely has gone away, and that's not going to be as much of a thing anymore. What it is good for the for the Joe Biden campaign, it it really identifies those people they got to go after, and it gives them some targets in places like Michigan um, and a few other places that they definitely need to show up. Joe Biden needs Michigan this fall if he's going to be president. So, Scott, you just mentioned Michigan, but if you were working on the Biden campaign, what other states would you be making the biggest push in? So I'm all about correlation, right? Like if Joe Biden loses Michigan, he's probably losing Wisconsin and it doesn't look good in Pennsylvania. Right. So not only Michigan, but Wisconsin, you know, the polling for Donald Trump looks really good in those three states right now. Now, there's a long way to go. But if he's worried about Michigan, he should be worried about Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, too. And he's going to need those three states, um, especially if uh, we you know, the conventional wisdom is is George is probably out of his reach this time around. So he's going to need to hold on uh, to those upper Midwest states. If he's worried about Michigan, he needs to be worried about Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. Scott Tranter from Decision Desk HQ, thank you so much for your insight as always. Thanks for having me. And that's it for What's America Thinking. Come back next week and be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And we want to hear from you. Leave us your comments and let us know what's on your mind.